let's just quickly review some of the things that we learned in the previous video, things that you actually probably were already familiar with. But first off, we talked about strong electrolytes. You know that those are substances which completely ionize or dissociate in water. They're strong conductors. And the thing that I actually want to add to that, what we had said before and point out in this video, is that strong electrolytes typically fall into three categories. They are the strong acids, they're the strong bases, and also the soluble ionic compounds. One of the reasons that I suggested that you learn the solubility rules is because it's important to be able to recognize ionic compounds which will dissolve and typically refer to, in many cases, these ionic compounds as salts. One of the most important things that you're going to have to develop the ability to do, and maybe you already can do, is when you look at a solution, know what really is floating around. Like, for instance, let's say that I have nitric acid, and I say it's aqueous nitric acid. When you see that formula and you see that it's aqueous, what do you think about? Well, hopefully what you think about is, in solution, what's really floating around, since it's a strong acid, is H plus and the nitrate. Um, same type of thing, if I see sodium chloride and someone tells me that it's aqueous, then what do I actually visualize in my mind? Hopefully what I visualize is that I really have sodium ion in solution and chloride ion in solution. Same thing's true for your bases. If you see potassium hydroxide, you don't think of potassium hydroxide as a compound floating around in solution. You think of potassium and hydroxide as distinct separate ions in solution. So strong electrolytes we think of in terms of ion in solution. You need to recognize all of these based on probably, for the most part, past information. How about weak electrolytes? Well, the two type of weak electrolytes that we need to deal with and you need to be aware of are weak acids and weak bases. The weak acids, hopefully you can recognize, acids have the form of hydrogen with some anion. If the acid isn't on the list of strong acids that you've memorized, then you know that it's weak. Our poster child for weak acid usually is acetic acid. We can write it a lot of different ways, but it's frequently written this way, where our anion is acetate and our hydrogen is in front. Our acidic hydrogen with an anion. Our poster child for weak bases usually is NH3. Okay, again, when you see a weak acid, like acetic acid floating around in solution, then what do you think about? I mean, the question again is, what's floating around? Well, the answer is, since it's a weak acid, some of the original acid is floating around, along with the hydrogen ion, along with the acetate. Okay, how about if we have a weak base? What's floating around? Well, since it's weak, the original molecule is floating around. Since it's a base, hydroxide's floating around, and since that base, original base, reacts with water to make the hydroxide, the other ion that's formed, which in this case is ammonia, is also floating around. Okay, just a quick reminder about some of the things that hopefully you've seen before and that you'll need to apply throughout this chapter. Let's move on. There are a number of ways to describe acid-base theory, or what an acid is and what a base is. Um, you're probably familiar with the original definition, which was that in water, something that makes H+, plus or H3O+, plus is an acid. In water, something that makes hydroxide, or OH-, is a base. That's the Arrhenius definition for acid 
acids and bases. Another way to describe acids and bases, which is a little bit more general than the definition which I gave you, is that an acid is a proton donor. Or we might say hydrogen ion or hydrogen, hydronium ion donor. And a base is a proton acceptor. Okay, why do we say proton? Just kind of convention of what's typically done, but you know that an H plus is a hydrogen without its electron. The only thing that's actually left is the proton. Examples of acids. Common one, hydrochloric acid. Example of a base might be hydroxide, and that could be sodium hydroxide or lithium hydroxide, any of a number of different things. Okay, for something to be a bronsted lori acid, what does it have to have as part of its structure? Well, if it's a proton donor or a hydrogen ion donor, the formula must have hydrogen. So the minimum would be hydrogen in the formula. And of course that would have to be in acidic hydrogens and not all hydrogens and molecules come off and produce H+, but at least you'd have to have um, hydrogen in the formula and you know the general formula for acids. Um, you'd know what to look for. Hydrogen along with some anion that you're familiar with. Okay, could we talk the same way about bases? What's necessary for some substance or some formula to accept a hydrogen ion? What would that be? The question really to ask is, how does it accept a hydrogen ion? What is it about the formula that allows it to bond with hydrogen or want hydrogen? Let's take a common weak base. We said that our poster child for weak bases would be NH3. And let's write the Lewis structure for NH3. What is it about NH3 that makes it able to accept hydrogens? Well, the answer lies in the fact that an H plus has no electrons. For something to accept H plus, it actually wants to form a bond or needs to form a bond with H plus. And bonds, at least covalent bonds, are made up by the sharing of electrons. The hydrogen has no electrons to give, to donate back and forth. Our base has to be the source of the electrons. So the minimum requirement for a base is that it must have a lone pair of electrons that would allow it to accept the hydrogen. So again, if I write minimum requirement I would say it is a lone pair of electrons. Does that apply to hydroxide? Does that meet the requirement? Well, of course, hydroxide's Lewis structure is that, and there are several lone pairs of electrons which are good at accepting electrons. Okay, let's actually just go back and review what acids do. We'll write a generic acid where A minus could be any anion with a minus one charge. And what we'll do throughout this chapter will be dealing with equilibrium for acids. And there's a weak acid donating a hydrogen or making a hydrogen available. And there's the equilibrium constant expression. Now, we'll put a subscript A frequently when we're dealing with acids, and that just means the ionization constant for a weak acid. Again, the acid is ionizing. It's equilibrium. Here's our equilibrium constant that we might call ionization constant for the acid. Let's just write 
again what ammonia does in water. Didn't leave myself too much room, but you'll recall this is how it goes about making hydroxide. And again, the lone pair on the ammonia accepts a hydrogen from water. That's the base. This is what we get. What would we do in terms of an equilibrium constant for this expression? Well, you can write this. But just to tie where we're headed back to what you did last chapter, here's our equilibrium constant. And because it's a weak base, ionizing, we would call it Kb, or that is the ionization constant for a weak base. Why didn't I write the water? Well, the water is a liquid, and liquids don't show up in equilibrium constant expression. Ammonia is aqueous, and whenever I write a charge on an ion, then that also is aqueous. All the ionic or charged substances that we have in solution are aqueous. So there's my equilibrium constant expression. Again, nothing too new, nothing too exciting at this point. Just review and a tie-in to what we had done before. Okay, now I want to introduce a new topic for you. And I'm going to do this by writing an acid-base equation and I'm going to again use our common weak acid, acetic acid. And I'm going to show this by allowing acetic acid to react with water. Hopefully you can follow right along. Hopefully, actually, you don't even need me for this and could write this expression. Okay, there's acetic acid reacting with water, making hydronium and the acetate anion. The concept that I want to introduce to you is acid-base conjugate pairs. I'm actually going to connect the acid-base conjugate pair. You know that acetic acid is an acid partly because you've probably memorized the name. Also, if you look at our definition for acid and see what acetic acid has done, you'll notice that acetic acid has donated its hydrogen to the water, therefore it's the acid on the left-hand side of the equation. What's left over of the acid after you've done that is acetate. Let's look at this from the perspective of water, though. What has water done? Well, if acetic acid has donated its hydrogen, water must have accepted the hydrogen. What does that make water in this reaction? It actually makes water the base because it's the hydrogen ion acceptor and the result is it becomes H3O+. Okay, now I want to change your perspective for a second. Our products are typically on the right-hand side, reactants on the left-hand side, but we have a two-directional arrow. We also could think in terms of the reverse direction for this reaction where we have H3O plus and acetate. If these are now thought of as the reactants, which is okay because again we have an arrow pointing towards the other side of the equation, what is H3O plus and what does it do? Well, we notice that H3O plus donates a hydrogen to acetate if we go in this direction. What does that make H3O plus? Well, it's no surprise, but that's our acid. What does that make C2H3O2 minus, what does that make our acetate? That makes it at the base because this is donating hydrogen ion to this. So in the reverse reaction, this is our acid and that's the base. If you look at what I've connected, I've connected something that in the forward direction is an acid with something that in the reverse direction is the base. Here I've connected something which in the forward direction is the base, and in the reverse direction is the acid. Acetic acid and acetate are acid-base conjugate pairs. Water and hydronium are acid-base conjugate pairs. Notice what the difference is between the acid and its conjugate base. The acid has one additional hydrogen relative to its conjugate base. It also has one ad additional positive charge relative to its conjugate base. Same is true here. One more hydrogen and positive charge than the conjugate base 
for water. Let's see if we can do the same thing with ammonia. Okay, I'll hurry and rewrite the equation of ammonia reacting with water to make ammonium and hydroxide. In the forward direction, what's taking place? Well, ammonia is accepting a hydrogen ion from water and becoming ammonium. So ammonia becomes ammonium. In this direction, ammonia, as the proton acceptor, is the base. What if I look in the opposite direction? What happens to the ammonium? Ammonium gives its hydrogen ion to hydroxide to become ammonia. Hydroxide picks up the hydrogen ion. So in this case, ammonium is the acid and hydroxide is the base. As it picks up the hydrogen, it makes its conjugate acid. Left to right, ammonia is our base, water is our acid. Right to left, ammonium is our acid, water is our base. Again, we have shown acid-base conjugate pairs for this reaction. The acid has one additional hydrogen ion relative to the base. You can always look at acid-base reactions based on bronsted lowry definition of acid-base reactions and identify the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. You also can simply have a formula for an acid, let's say. We'll just write sulfuric acid. And just from the formula, we could write its conjugate base. How does it differ from its conjugate base? One hydrogen and a positive charge. So what's the conjugate base for sulfuric for sulfuric acid, it would be the bisulfate ion. Maybe an interesting question to ask is then, what's the conjugate base of the bisulfate ion? Because it still has an acidic hydrogen that it could give. Well, the conjugate base would have one less hydrogen and positive charge. So the conjugate base would be the sulfate ion. In this pair, bisulfate is the conjugate acid and sulfate is its conjugate base. And you could do that for any acid-base pair. Now, let's compare what we've seen. Here's an acid which makes this conjugate base. Here's a base which makes this conjugate acid. Acid strength is a measure of how readily an acid ionizes to form H+. I haven't saved much room for this. But I could write the formula again for a strong acid. What do you expect from nitric acid? You ex expect it to fully ionize. It's a strong acid because it readily makes H plus in solution. Base strength is a measure of how strongly a base ex attracts hydrogen ion. The stronger the base, the more attraction it will have for hydrogen ion. Hydroxide is a strong base and it attracts hydrogen ion well and makes water. With that in mind, with the fact that strong acids are great at giving up hydrogen ions, strong bases are great at attracting hydrogen ions, I want you to think in terms of acid-base conjugate pairs and the relative strengths of acids and bases. If I have a weak acid, what does that tell me about the acid? It tells me it isn't great at producing H plus or H zero plus. If that's the case, what does that tell me about its conjugate base? What it actually tells me is the conjugate base is relatively good at hanging on to the hydrogen ion or keeping the equilibrium shifted to the left. That's what I mean by this statement. The weaker an acid is, the greater the base strength of its conjugate base. Now I didn't say that that would mean since acetic acid is a weak acid, that its conjugate base, acetate, is a strong base. I'm just saying in relative terms, the weaker an acid is, the stronger its conjugate base because the weaker the acid is, the stronger its conjugate base is at hanging onto the hydrogen keeping that acid in solution. Now, the weaker a base is, the greater the acid strength of its conjugate base. Look at nitrate, for instance. In terms of acid-base conjugate pairs, we'd say, say nitric acid is the acid. Its conjugate base is nitrate. Now, tell me, does nitrate hang on to hydrogens? Think about what you know. 
about strong acids. There's a one directional arrow. We expect nitric acid to fully be ionized into nitrate and hydrogen ion. What does that tell us? It tells us that although this may be by name the conjugate base of nitric acid, when you put it in contact with hydrogen, it doesn't accept the hydrogen or attract the hydrogen. Because this is a strong acid, its conjugate base is extremely weak. It doesn't hang on to hydrogen ions at all. So nitric acid is a strong acid, therefore nitrate is an extremely, almost pathetically, weak base. So this is something that we'll use and hopefully is somewhat intuitive to you by the time we get very much farther into this chapter. Now there's one more thing that I want you to consider in terms of a definition we'll come up with and something that's important, very important, when we get to the pH concept. Let me just finish this reaction. You've seen that many times before. And you know now that when we put water, put water with a weak acid, or any acid for that matter, what do we what does it do? It acts like a base and accepts the hydrogen. What if we put water with something that we know to be a base? What happens? In that case, it acts like an acid and becomes its conjugate base or donates a hydrogen ion. Water's interesting and fairly unique in some ways. You put it with an acid, it acts like a base. You put it with a base and it acts like an acid. What do we call substances that can act as both acids and bases? We call those substances amphoteric. Can act as an acid or a base. Okay, based on what we said, the minimum requirement for something to act as an acid is, and what the minimum requirement is for something to act as a base, what is the characteristic, the structural characteristic of something that is amphoteric? First off, it must have hydrogen if it's going to act as an acid, and water qualifies. Second off, what's the requirement for it to be a base? It must have a lone pair. Water does have lone pairs, therefore it can act as an acid and a base. Based on its Lewis structure, you can see that that's the case. Another term that's similar to that is amphiprotic. What does that mean? That's something that can donate a proton or also accept a proton. It's another way of describing something that can act as an acid or a base. Let's deal with one more concept. We know now that water is amphoteric. We know that that means it can act as an acid or as a base. Now, what I want you to think about is what then will happen if I put water with water. Probably what you're saying is if you put water with water, you're going to get water. And that's true. But I want you to think in terms of acid-base reaction. If water can act as a base when it's with an acid or as an acid when it's with a base, when it's with itself it should also be able to, or on its own, it should also be able to do those things. To a certain degree, when I put water with water, or another way to say that, just in any water sample, whether it's the water you're drinking or in your bathtub, you will have a certain amount of the water that will be hydronium and a certain amount of the water that will be hydroxide. You could even just think of this in terms of one water molecule to a certain extent falling apart or ionizing to make hydronium and hydroxide. And believe it or not, this does happen. In fact, the water you're drinking contains, even if it's distilled and as pure as you can make it, it contains a certain amount of hydronium ion and a certain amount of hydroxide ion. These are liquids. 
these are in solution or aqueous. You'll notice that what we've done is write an equilibrium expression. And sure enough, if that's the case, we can write an expression for an equilibrium constant based on this equilibrium. Kw is the ionization constant of water. It's equal to the product of the hydronium ion concentration in water and the hydroxide ion concentration in water. If we are basing this on this equation, and it really doesn't matter again which way we write it, that would be our expression for Kw. Now, since it's is ionization constant, you would expect that it would have a number that someone's determined by now. And sure enough, they have. The ionization constant for water is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th at common temperature. Now, what does this do for us? As we begin to deal with acid-base equilibria, the hydrogen ion concentration will become very important or the hydronium ion concentration, whichever way you're looking at the equilibrium, as you'd expect based on this equilibria that you see, and the hydroxide ion concentration will be very important. So it's important for us to understand how to use this relationship. Notice that from this expression, we could find out the hydrogen ion concentration, hydroxide ion concentration in water, and we could do that just with a regular equilibrium constant expression. We could say how much water is going to ionize into H plus and OH minus. We could find this out by setting up an equilibrium expression for, now that we have the number for the equilibrium constant we can solve for that concentration and what we'll find if you take the square root of 1 times 10 to the minus 14th is that X which is the hydrogen ion concentration, which is also equal to the hydroxide ion concentration in pure water, is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7th molar. So now you know that if you're drinking pure water at room temperature, you're actually drinking 1.0 times 10 to the 7th molar acid or base. It's neutral because they're equal under those circumstances. How else might we use that? Well, someone might come along and say, just mark this off. They might say that you have an H plus ion concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus third molar and ask what is the hydroxide ion concentration? Well, how would you go about this? We could start with our equilibrium constant expression. We know the hydrogen ion concentration and we just need to solve for hydroxide. As we divide through by the hydrogen ion concentration what we'll find is that hydroxide ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11th molar. Realize that as we increase H3O plus, based on the relationship which we have, we decrease the hydroxide ion con concentration. The product of those two in solution will all be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th. Well, we'll build off of these concepts as we begin to talk about pH in our next section.